My name is Alan Rennick, and welcome to UCL Uncovering Politics, the podcast of the School of Public Policy and Department of Political Science at University College London. The quality of public services, whether health, education, water supply, sewage disposal, has a big impact on all of our lives. How to enhance that quality is therefore one of the big questions for political studies. And my colleague, Mark Esteve, is one of the leading experts on exactly that issue. And to coincide with his inaugural lecture as Professor of Public Management here in the UCL Department of Political Science, I'm delighted that Mark joins me now. So, Mark, welcome back to UCL Uncovering Politics. As with all of our episodes linked to an inaugural lecture, we're going to be focusing on some of the specific pieces of research that you talk about in the lecture, but we'll also be exploring your wider career and your research agenda a little bit more. So let's maybe start with that big picture and a big opening question. What is it that drives your research agenda? Well, thank you, Alan. Thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure to uh, be here again. This is my second podcast. Um, and it's really great to be able to explain what drives my research um, to the audience. So I've always been, uh, I guess that this... My whole research interest probably comes from the fact that my, my whole family have been public servants. Um, my father, my mother, my uncles, everyone, my wife now, everyone has been working in one, uh, especially in the education sector. And my father ended up being the head of immigration for the city of Barcelona. And I remember since I was a kid that uh, both my father and my mother used to argue about how challenging it was to deliver good public services. They were both very adamant on, on really helping citizens. Uh, my father focusing on immigration, my mother was working as a teacher in a high school that was a very a very conflictive high school in a particular rough area of the city. Um, probably one of the most challenging high schools in, in Catalonia. And they were both usually arguing how they needed more resources, they needed better management, they needed more political support. Um, my father used to say that immigration is such a complex topic that sometimes the better you do your job, um, the more demand you're going to uh, create because obviously there is you know, more people will be willing to come and take advantage of those services. And then my father was saying, well, but that's exactly what we want. We want to be able to help as many people as possible, but we just need to find ways in which we can do that. So I guess that probably growing up with those ideas uh, certainly affected my, my research interest. So um, the overall um, sort of research question that drives me is how to provide better public services. So how to implement those ideas that policymakers have uh, in a better way, uh, achieving higher quality public services, but also making it through uh, efficient ways to really make sure that um, we can we can achieve better services for as many people as possible. That would be the, the overall idea. And in your lecture, you talk about a concept called the relational state. And if I understand correctly, so, so I should just explain for listeners that we're this episode is going to be released just after the lecture, but we're actually recording it beforehand. So I've seen your slides, but I haven't yet heard the lecture. So you, you, you have lots of slides about the relational state. And if I understand it, that's a kind of core concept that you, you use to... to to organize your, your lecture. Absolutely. What is the relational state and why, why, why is it important? So the relational state is the, the overall framework that guides my research. Uh, it's a concept that was coined by two colleagues of mine, Xavier Mendoza and Alfred Bernays, more than 20 years ago. And it's, it's a concept that evolves from the idea of the welfare state, in which we imagine a government that is very strong and is able and capable of implementing services by itself. Uh, their idea when they propose the relational state is that public services, now that we have seen that the demand for public services is increasing, we want more public services than ever. And at the same time, we ask for high quality on all of these public services, but citizens are not particularly willing to pay more taxes to fund these public services. So there is a bit of a contradiction here, because on the one hand, we want more, but we are probably not willing as a society to give more. 
uh, Xavier Mendoza and Alfred Bernice proposed to kind of uh, break with the idea of the welfare state. And they propose that public services, while they are the responsibility of the public sector, of governments, uh, societies should not let governments alone in the delivery of these services. And what they argue for is an active collaboration between the public sector, the private sector, the non-profit sector, and citizens. And they go further and they explain that each of these sectors has a different role within this uh, relational state. So the public sector, for example, since it's the ultimate responsible for the service, should be a leader. That should really make sure that uh, the services are of high quality and that everyone gets the most out of these collaborations. The private sector at the same time should understand that maybe the revenues that they can have from one of the projects in collaboration with the public sector might not be as large as they were usually be accustomed to, but that they have, for example, much more stability that they can have in the open market, working with the public sector. NGOs, for instance, non non-profit uh, organizations, have to also realize that it's not enough as a business model to live just out of the help of governments or private donors but that in some cases they can also compete directly uh, with the market and try to help in the implementation of any particular service. And as for citizens, I think the, the best way of, of, of explaining our role should be if you don't want to pay more uh, money to have your streets clean more often, at the very least you should make sure that you do not throw any garbage on the streets, right? So this idea of co-responsibility with citizens is quite important. Um, this idea that we should all have very good public services at our disposal is very important, but at the same time, we are active actors on our societies and the actions that we make in those societies will matter too. Being a Brit, listening to that makes me think of David Cameron and the big society. <laughs> is, is that where my brain should be going? Well, I think that I, I want to think that I have a lot of um, ideological differences with <laughs> David Cameron and his government. Fair enough. Um, but, but I think the idea behind this is we should all have to understand that public services, the demand for public services is going to increase. For example, we are getting older, which I think is a very good thing, right? As a society, we tend to live more years than before. But this also means that the needs that we have, for example, in terms of social care, or health services are going to increase. Uh, how are we going to face this increase in public services from the government perspective is something that I don't think we are discussing at this moment. Mm -hmm. And I think that for a very long time, we've seen, for example, public, public and private sector collaborations from a political perspective in which probably left-oriented politicians were originally happy to externalize public services, whereas uh, left-oriented politicians were probably more against that. And I think that the idea should be externalizations are not good or, or bad per se. They can be good if they are well managed. And good management is something that should not be uh, of any political color, on the contrary, right? Regardless of which particular policies governments want would like to implement, I think we should really put a premium on how we can implement them effectively and how at the very end these policies are successful. That's the that's focus of, mm -hmm. of these concepts. Yeah, fantastic, thank you. So that's a really great kind of overview of, of where your research is going. Just to go back to your childhood again and where all of this research agenda comes from, you talked about that a little bit a moment ago. Um, I'm really intrigued by a slide that you've got for your lecture that starts with chess and seems that then goes to rugby and then goes through a whole series of different degrees that you've done. So the path that you have taken to this research agenda is quite something. Do you want to explain for listeners what, Absolutely. what happened? It's, it's probably difficult to make sense of my career um, <laughs> when you look at it. Um, but when I was a kid, I used to be a, a chess player. And I would uh, train every afternoon uh, quite seriously. I was not a, a great chess player, but I was a decent one, I guess. And over the years, though, my, my parents realized that I was having um, some issues making friends, probably. Um, you know, I was um, kind of very close with myself 
Um, and then they thought that maybe what I needed was to stop playing chess every afternoon and, and maybe uh, uh, maybe playing uh, any sport uh, with the team would help. And as it happened, near my, my house in Barcelona, we had this uh, great uh, rugby field. And then they thought, you know, I, I was reasonably tall and, and, and strong, so they thought maybe rugby is something that, that he will enjoy. And I agree with them. So I joined a, a rugby team, and, and I absolutely love it. Mm -hmm. I discovered that I was, um, even though I, I, you know, I, I was usually pictured as this um, kind of lonely kid that would play chess, uh, when I was in a rugby field, I would transform myself and, and really thrive. Um, so I, I started playing rugby, and I took it very seriously, and I, I become a professional rugby player. Wow. Uh, I signed for another club, uh, Football Club Barcelona, which people will probably know for their uh, football team. Uh -huh. <laughs> they also had a, a rugby team. Wow. And, uh, and then I started playing with them. Mm -hmm. and, and I was supposed, I always thought that I would become uh, a medical student. Uh, I wanted to be a doctor. And then uh, the day that I was uh, going to register myself for universities, when I went back home, I told my parents, um, I've registered for um, sports sciences. Uh -huh. And then, well, my, my father kind of, let's say, to be polite, that he didn't quite agree with that decision. And, and he said, basically, you've made a huge mistake. Uh, you like to play sports, but that doesn't mean that you will have to study them. Uh -huh. um, so you should go back and try to change that. And then my mother, uh, being a mother, said, you know, you should... Tell to my father, he told to my father, um, you should let the kid do whatever he wants and we should just support him. Um, so that's what they did. But in fact, my father was quite right. And when I started studying sports science, I realized that uh, what I liked about the sports was practicing them, mm -hmm. not so much studying them. Um, so then I told them I would like to quit and go to medical school. And then uh, I think they thought, what if this kid now starts quitting everything without finding the place? So my, my family told me, we are happy to pay for a second degree. You could study two degrees at the same time, but you're not going to quit. Nothing. Mm -hmm. So then I, I tried to get into medical school, but, but the, the schedule was clashing with my sports science bachelor. So I ended up doing uh, another thing that I thought was very interesting, which was psychology. Uh -huh. So I did two uh, undergraduate degrees at the same time, sports science and psychology. It sounds like hard work. Yeah, it was. And it playing was, rugby at the same time? Well, uh, unfortunately, I got a, a pretty bad injury okay. on, on one of my legs. So my, my professional career lasted only for a couple of years, okay. <laughs> which meant that I had plenty of time to study. And uh -huh. I discovered that I absolutely love it. I love studying. And probably this is one of the reasons why I have ended up in, in academia, because I, I, yeah, I really love spending time in the library going through papers and, and reading uh, someone else's studies. Yes. So after that, I did a master's in health science. And then at some point, I thought that I, I was kind of always very much focused on public services. I realized that all my dissertations, all my sort of final capstones or projects had been in one way or another related with public services and the management of those services. So I just thought, mm, you know, I was very clear on the idea that I wanted to do a PhD. And I thought maybe a PhD in, in public management would be in order. So I joined a, a SADE, which is a very good business school. And they had some great experts on public management. And they trained me on, on core management concepts that I was then able to apply to the public sector. And that's how I ended up at UCL. It's a wonderful story of how academic careers don't always just follow a straight Absolutely. path. Absolutely. <laughs> and there can be a very meandering path. I mean, do you think that meandering path still affects the nature of the work that you do today? Does that grounding in medical sciences of various different kinds? I think so, because I've used... So, for example, um, one thing that you will realize if you go through my CV is that I've published more than 40 uh, papers. None of them are single author. Mm. I've never done a single author paper because I, I just love to collaborate with people. Mm. And in most cases, these uh, colleagues of mine are from other fields. So I like to think that I have a very sort of broad approach to, to public management. I've worked with economists, I've worked with uh, management scholars, I've worked with political scientists, and, and with engineers. 
uh, with data scientists. And I, I think that there is a lot of value in really approaching problems from different disciplines. Mm. Fascinating, fascinating. Let's get on then to some of your particular research. So as you described it earlier, you argue that the relational state is the way forward, but it's also quite difficult to get the relational state to Definitely. work effectively. And so a lot of your work has focused on understanding just how can we how can we achieve that. And I guess one of the core themes in that is that there are lots of different organizational forms that can be followed in the delivery of public services, and some of those might work better than, than others. Exactly. Um, I guess before we go into some of the detail, do you want to just explain what are the kinds of options that are available? What do we mean by organizational forms? That's a very good question. So by organizational forms, we mean what's the difference between implementing a public service through a main governmental body, so classic public sector, or, for example, doing something that is a little bit more uh, new, like a public agency, for example. So what are the differences in terms of the quality of the service uh, of the efficiency of the service, if we implement a public service through a main governmental body, the ministry, for example, or through a public agency, which still will depend on the ministry, but will have more managerial freedom uh, and will be further away, so to speak, from politicians. At the same time, we have other organizational forms that would allow us to collaborate with the private sector or with the nonprofit sector, for example, public private partnerships. Mm. And here, we can discuss what's the difference, for example, between externalizing a service and doing what we call a contractual public-private partnership in which the public sector, for example, wants to build a highway and they sign a contract with a private provider uh, for which the private provider is going to build a highway and the public sector is going to pay a little bit every year for the next maybe 40 years. In the U.S. now we have highways that have contracts for 80 or 120 years. So it's in a way like asking for a mortgage when we buy a house, right? Uh, and at the same time, we have another organizational form in which the collaboration between the public and the private sector is more active. And we call it a public-private joint venture. In these cases, what we have are new organizations that are uh, managed both by the public and the private actors together. Uh, so here we don't have a contractual relation but really a new organization in which everyone would be able to have a say. And one of the things that I've tried to do in, in my career also was to really differentiate between the concepts of externalization and privatization. Because I think that for political reasons, we've been using the word privatization for any situation in which the private sector gets involved mm -hmm. in the delivery of public services. Mm. So for some people, if right now um, we have a highway and we externalize the service to a private provider, we will say that this has been privatized. And I don't think that's necessarily right. I think the way that I understand privatization is when the government decides that the service should no longer be considered a public service. And therefore, the only role that the government has with that service is to regulate it as any other economic activity in the country. But if it's still considered a public service, which means it's still the responsibility, so the government has to guarantee that everyone receives that service, and the private sector is involved, here we would be talking about some form of public-private collaboration. But I wouldn't refer to it as a privatization. So just thinking in a UK context, you, we can talk about privatization in relation to British gas, for example, exactly. but not Absolutely. in relation to the railways. Absolutely. Yeah. That's how I would picture it, yeah. yeah. Okay, great. That's really clear. Mm -hmm. And so in the lecture, you talk about several papers in which you've explored different aspects of organizational forms and what works better, what doesn't. Um, mm -hmm. One of those, as you said, we, you, we, we were lucky enough to have you on the podcast last year, and we talked <laughs> yeah. about one of those papers last time, uh, talking about the relative performance of public agencies and public corporations, exactly. I think. Um, and listeners will be able to find that episode online. So let's focus here on another very recent study that you've done with uh, co-authors looking at different structures of accountability for public services. What's the mm. question that you ask there and, and what do you find? Here the main question was, um, in, in some countries, particularly in Europe, uh, there is a, a very large and, and, and live debate about whether public services should be directly paid by the public sector 
costs of implementing those services should be covered by the public sector, or whether citizens should pay a fee when they use these services. So we wanted to know what difference does it make for the quality and the efficiency of the service. So here in this particular study, we were able to analyze how different organizational forms will be affected by asking users to pay a fee or by having governments simply paying the fee themselves for every user. And what we find is that, which I think is interesting, if you are, if you're committed to implementing a service, trying to reach as many people as possible, but you want to do it as, you, know, you, you don't care about the quality. So let's say, I mean, in a nutshell, low quality service, uh, externalization should work much better. So the private sector is very good at providing low quality services. And by very good, I mean they do it cheaper. Uh -huh. It's cheaper for the private sector to provide low quality public services than it is for governments. But obviously, our listeners, as, as ourselves, would prefer to have high quality public services. So the question is, well, when we consider quality, which organizational form works best? What we have figured out is that there isn't much differences in terms of efficiency when the quality of the service is taken into consideration. So if you don't care about quality, if you want low quality, the private sector will do it cheaper. But if you want high quality, there isn't really strong differences across organizational forms. There aren't strong differences? No, there aren't. Uh -huh. But what it's interesting is, probably the question should be, what is the situation that would give us higher quality services? And what we have found is that it's when we externalize the service to the private sector, but it's unfortunately for our politicians, um, because this has usually, um, you know, this doesn't really play well on a voting poll. Um, it's when we ask users to pay a fee for the service. And the argument that we use to explain these results is we don't think that the public sector is very good at holding accountable private sector providers for public services. We don't think that the public sector has the monitoring capacity to really understand how those services are being provided. But when you ask users to pay a fee for the service, in a way, the private sector now doesn't have one big client, which is the government. But instead, every user becomes a possible client. So if the quality of the service is not high, the user might stop using that particular service. So the private sector has a much stronger incentive to make sure that the services that they are providing are best, you know, are better. And that's what the data tells us. And that's an argument, I mean, in favor of kind of market-based accountability yeah. that we tend to associate with the right. Uh, but you're arguing, I think, that the left should uh, listen to this. Uh, so, I'm, I'm, I mean, as well. full disclosure, I'm very left-oriented myself, <laughs> um, which means that sometimes I, I, I find myself in a difficult position because some of the arguments that I defend have been traditionally embraced by... Uh, right-oriented uh, politicians or individuals. But my idea is that good management should be transversal. There is no political color to good public management because at the end of the day, uh, left-oriented politicians, left-oriented individuals like myself, we really care about helping citizens and having societies with the strong public services. And I think that it's our duty to explore every single opportunity that we have to make sure that these services are well provided. Mm. And in that sense, I think that good public management, and in this case, if what works is market rules, then let's make sure that we have governments that know how to operate within those market rules. Mm. And one of the things that we need to explore further is whether our findings are true for every particular service. Because in this study, we have been able to analyze water services. But I would be interested in knowing whether these results hold for more complex services, like social services, for example, in which measuring the quality of the service becomes much more difficult. Mm. And this is one of the uh, research lines that we are trying to develop at the moment. And presumably the left is going to be concerned mm. that if you have services paid for through presumably flat fees being paid by individuals rather than through progressive taxation, then there are harmful distributional consequences of that. So I guess your, your argument would be that we need to 
deal with redistribution further upstream. Absolutely. R- rather than in the, serv- the moment of service delivery. Absolutely. I think that in this sense, a government should help citizens and not the private sector organizations. Hmm. Because one of the things that we've seen with some of the studies that we've done is that public-private partnerships can work very, very well. But in some cases, they can also be really poor deals for uh, governments and citizens because there are some private sector organizations that in the past have literally taken advantage of, I would say, the lack of management skills that we find in some governments. In this sense, particularly, for example, at the local level, we've seen a lot of examples across the world of small municipalities um, signing uh, public-private partnerships agreements with very large corporations in which on the one side of the table you had extremely well-trained lawyers from the top organizations, the top universities, uh, dealing with very committed public servants, but they didn't have that uh, level of skills. So the final agreements that they were signing were very, very, um, let's say, bad for the public service, right? Uh, and I think this is something that we have to fight against. We're trying to cover a lot of ground here. So we've, <laughs> we, look, there's so much more we could talk about in relation to that paper. But let's move on to another. Mm-hmm. And we've been talking there about kind of big structural questions, organizational forms. But you also talk in the lecture about some of your earlier research where you pointed out that um, how different structures perform depends also on different kind of management strategies and ways of managing these sort of networks of collaboration that you have in the relational state. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that work? Absolutely. One of the studies, one of the first studies that we published, um, the argument that we have here is that we are not so interested probably in which organizational form works best. But maybe the real question should be, because we have many different organizational forms operating right now, Maybe the real question should be how to manage them better, each and every one of them. And in this particular paper, we looked at how to manage collaborations across sectors. And what we find out is that this type of collaborations entail very, very huge costs in terms of management, meaning they can work very well, but public managers and policymakers should be made aware that they are extremely difficult and challenging to manage, meaning they will have to devote much more attention to these projects than if they were to do it alone, in-house. And I think this is something important because even though in theory they can work very well, I don't think our governments are ready to implement every public sector in collaboration with another uh, organization because of the management complexities that that would entail. And what we found in this uh, particular paper is we looked at the leadership style of policymakers and public management, uh, public managers, sorry. We also look at how many chats, how many emails did they even exchange, how many meetings they had with uh, private partners and other public partners that were involved in these collaborations. And what we found is that there is a direct relationship between how active they are in managing these uh, ventures and the final performance of the venture, mm-hmm. meaning... You know, good projects need a lot of attention. Mm. I love that you managed to go into so much detail into just how people are managing these things across a huge range of different public service mm-hmm. delivery units. Um, and you do that through surveys of lots of people involved. Is that right? Exactly. So in this case, for example, we did a, something called a structural equation modeling, which is very helpful to see the different mediating and moderating relationships that you can have between different variables. Um, And in this particular study, we use a survey to actual um, collaboration managers, to managers of these services. But I think one of the things that I've always tried uh, across my studies is to really look at different sectors and different areas, different services. And I've also been very fortunate to work with very different methods, qualitative, quantitative, experimental designs. And I think this has really helped me to to better understand the reality that I'm trying to analyze. Mm. Um, so that, I mean, if, if there is one characteristic probably of my research besides the topic is this, this sort of uh, different methods that I've been able to use with different co-authors um, to analyze the same thing. And that has certainly helped me. That leads on wonderfully to my final question, yeah. which is you've got all of this evidence on what works in terms of how to deliver public services. Mm. 
are the decision makers who are deciding what form these public services will take, are they listening to that kind of evidence or are they making more kind of politically based decisions? Well, the, the short answer is no, they are not. <laughs> they are not <laughs> particularly eager at listening to this, as to many other evidences, I think. But um, in one of the studies that we've done, we were really trying to understand how how the electoral cycle would affect cross-sectoral collaborations. Our argument was that um, collaborations are still being perceived as right-oriented, so that the involvement of the private sector is still being perceived as something that right political parties would do. And we wanted to see whether that was the case. So what we did was trying to see with longitudinal data, in this case in Spanish municipalities, we looked at what happens the very year in which elections are being uh, um, are being happen. And what we found was that overall, politicians don't want to engage with the private sector when we have elections. But then we wanted to see, okay, this could have two explanations. One would be, these are very complex projects, and maybe politicians don't want to start them at the very end of their mandate, which would be very sensible. Obviously, the other argument would be, they are afraid of what the public opinion could say if a newspaper was to publish, this government is, to, is going to privatize water services in this municipality, right? Um, so in order to differentiate between these two arguments, we looked at how different political parties react to collaboration when we have elections. And what we found very clearly is that right-oriented political parties care much less about uh, privatizations in the sense, um, wrongly uh, named, but about collaborating with the private sector when elections come than left oriented political parties, which it's very interesting because we then did a, another study in which we asked citizens uh, from right and left oriented um, ideologies whether they care about whether the service was being provided in collaboration with the private sector or with the public sector alone. And the answer was very, very clear. The very vast majority wants high quality public services. And they don't care about the organizational form that governments use to get them those services as long as the services work. So if I could just send a message to policymakers or politicians, it would be forget uh, the idea that collaboration with the private sector is something of the right uh, political parties. Not at all. You know, good implementation is something that citizens value, regardless of their political orientation. What's going on then? Why are politicians misperceiving public attitudes if they are as you describe? To be honest, I, I don't know. I don't think politicians are very rational. I think that um, this is not the only topic, unfortunately, that they are misperceiving. <laughs> that would be my opinion. But I hope that with the recent studies that we have started to publish, they will little and little start to understand that good public management, good governance in the public sector is paramount for citizens. And if left-oriented political parties really want to help their citizens, which is what I think we want, I think they should embrace the fact that a strong public sector, and by a strong I don't mean a large one, but I mean one that it's ready to deal equal to equal with the private sector and get good deals with the private sector, get the most out of it, and be able to use all the resources at their disposal, this is something that ultimately is going to help citizens. So I think it should be of your interest. Well, let us hope they hear that message. You've given it loud and clear, and it's been fascinating to talk about this, Mark. Thank you so much. It's great to have you back on the podcast. Thank you very much, Alan. We've been discussing Mark's inaugural lecture. It's called Enhancing the Quality of Our Public Services. By the time you listen to this, the lecture will already have happened. If you're listening immediately following release of the podcast episode, however, the recording of the lecture won't be available yet. But it will come very soon, and we promise to... Uh, add the link to the show notes for this episode as soon as we have it. In the meantime, we've discussed three of Mark's co-authored studies, uh, in particular during the course of the episode here, and details of those are in the show notes for the episode now. And you'll also find there a link to Mark's previous podcast appearance where we explored his work, as I said, on uh, contrasting public agencies and public corporations. <laughs>
This has been our final episode for 2023. The Christmas tree is up here in Tavistock Square. The chestnuts are being roasted and we'll be taking a little break over the next few weeks. But we'll be back in January with another series exploring the very latest in political science research. As ever, to make sure you don't miss out on that or other future episodes of UCL Uncovering Politics, all you need to do is subscribe. You can do so on Apple, Google Podcasts, or whatever podcast provider you use. And while you're there, we'd love it if you could take a moment of time to rate or review us too. I'm Alan Rennick. This episode was produced by Alice Hart and Eleanor Kingwell Bannum. Our theme music is written and performed by John Mann. This has been UCL Uncovering Politics. Thank you for listening and have a very happy Christmas. Thank you.